Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, NPTEL course on computational process design. In the last session, we have looked at the uh, material and energy balance. What we are going to look at today is equipment sizing, uh, costing and economic evaluation. So, if you look at the equipment sizing and costing, uh, these are pivotal factors in the economic assessment of the industrial processes. Uh, these are having the direct influence on the both initial investment and ongoing operational expenses associated with the process design and implementation. Again, uh, precise cost projection stemming from equipment sizing and costing are imperative for the informed decision making regarding the process feasibility, profitability and overall economic sustainability. Further, these projections are important because we wanted to find out the uh, investment evaluations. Again, these are important for financial strategizing. Uh, these are also important for risk evaluations within the uh, realm of process equipment uh, development and operation. So, in the early stages of the process exploration and evaluation, uh, leveraging the approximations and established methodologies is indispensable for expeditiously and comprehensively assessing the diverse process alternatives. So, what we are trying to say here is in the initial uh, flow sheet design, we usually have some approximations uh, primarily because we wanted to evaluate different options uh, faster and comprehensively. Again, uh, swift computations and qualitative trained identification empower engineers and stakeholders to uh, evaluate and contrast various process avenues and facilitate the uh, recognition of promising alternatives and dismissal of less tenable options. So, clearly the faster calculations based on the simple calculations uh, is very very important because then you can uh, find out the promising alternatives and eliminate the less tenable options. The last one is established methodologies such as you know Guthrie's cost estimation method. These are uh, this can give the frameworks for estimating the equipment expenditures, streamlining the preliminary design efforts and economic evaluations. So, if you look at the uh, different estimates, so preliminary design usually have around uh, less than 40 percent error. So, uh, you can see that it is attributed to the limited level of details available during the preliminary design. Uh, but despite of this, this is important to have primarily because uh, even the order of magnitude estimate serves as a valuable tool for assessing the feasibility of the various process alternatives. So, that is why even though the preliminary design has almost uh, around 40 percent error, uh, still it is important. But as we go ahead, you can see that the process design progresses into later stages, a study estimate is utilized. So, study estimates are the estimate where the error is less than 25 percent and you can see that in this case, we have a refined cost approximations with reduced error margin of around, uh, you know, less than 25 percent. So, uh, you can see that this estimate, this estimate offers greater precision primarily because of the uh, you know acquisition of more detailed information during the development process. As we further go ahead in the advanced stages of process development, then we have a preliminary estimate. So, preliminary estimate is where the, uh, the error is less than 12 percent and it reflects the higher degree of accuracy. So, you can see that the error margin for this estimation uh, is less than 12 percent and this indicates that it is more precise assessment of the capital cost based on the comprehensive design data. Then as we further progresses in these stages of the process development, you can see that we can reduce the error further to lower value. So, definitive estimate has the error less than 6 percent. Uh, so, in this stage, you can see that the detailed design information is available with us and therefore, we can make the accurate projection of the capital cost. So, uh, in this case, you can see that uh, this estimate provides a, re a reliable basis for the financial planning, investment decision and risk assessment as the error is less than 6 percent. 
so as we further process and design is more or less complete a detailed estimate is characterized uh, where the error you can see that is less than 3% so at this stage where the comprehensive design information is accessible this estimation method offers an extremely accurate representation of the capital cost again it supports the informed decision making and also thorough financial uh, analysis so if you look at the equipment sizing so equipment sizing is crucial for determining the physical attributes and specifications of various process units ensuring optimal performance and cost effectiveness so accurate equipment sizing is essential for achieving efficient operation and meeting process requirements so if you look at the equipment sizing there are four different types of uh, sizing which are primarily taken into the consideration the first one is the vessel sizing and specification the second one is heat transfer equipment sizing and then distillation and absorption column sizing and finally the sizing of compressors pumps and refrigeration so each of these four type of sizing and specification we are going to look at little bit in more detail so let's look at the vessel sizing and specification so calculation of vessel size and specification is conducted by considering various parameters so we look at the flow rates we look at temperatures we look at the pressure and material uh, compatibility so this process involves meticulous consideration of factors such as you know vessel capacity height cross sectional area and pressure relating to the to ensure the optimal performance and safety similarly for heat transfer equipment uh, the sizing calculations is based on the heat duties which are required what are the temperature difference uh, present and the fluid properties so typically uh, engineers determine the appropriate heat transfer surface areas and dimensions to effectively meet the process heat exchange requirements while considering the factors such as fluid flow characteristics and thermal conductivity if you look at the separation units like distillation and absorption uh, usually the sizing of distillation and absorption columns involve the Uh, consideration of the parameters such as tray or packing heights also the diameters of the uh, column and efficiencies so uh, engineers usually calculate the column dimensions to achieve the desired specification and absorption efficiencies ensuring the optimal performance and resource utilization and if you look at the last type where we are uh, trying to look at the sizing of compressor pumps and refrigeration units Uh, these are conducted by evaluating the pressure requirements present also what are the flow rates we are uh, trying to ensure and temperature differentials again engineers determine the equipment capacities and specifications to effectively handle process flow and meet the refrigeration needs of the system considering the factors such as energy efficiency and operational reliability so each of these four uh, sizing and specification of different equipments we are going to look at in more detail so let us start with the vessel sizing so vessels are an important component in many chemical processes so vessels are like reactors tanks all these we are considering as vessels and their sizing and costing are critical for economic evaluations of the candidate flow sheet so uh, selecting the vessel volume is important so it is based on usually how it is calculated so usually to calculate the vessel sizing we assume a 5 minute liquid hold up so if we assume a 5 minute liquid hold up time uh, with an added equal volume for the vapor flows so you can see that we can get the volume equals to 2 into fl uh, into tau divided by rho l so here fl is the liquid flow rate tau is the residence time rho l is the density of the liquid and 2 we have added because we are assuming that there is a equal volume added for the vapor flows so here in this equation we can put tau equals to 5 5 uh, minutes and based on that we can calculate the v so so this is going to give us the vessel volume so in this case again uh, we also make different assumptions here like the aspect ratio l by d is assumed to be uh, 4 for general costing purposes so uh, what it reflects it reflects that we are considering the cost of the bottom and the top caps as four times as that of the side 
So that is what we are assuming when we are taking L by D equals to 4. So if the diameter exceeds 4 feet, let us say the diameter of the vessel is more than uh, 1.2 meter or 4 feet. In that case, we are considering this design as a uh, horizontal vessel. And in this case, when we consider the vessel as a horizontal vessel, uh, there uh, the important factor is to manage the space requirement instead of the structural support cost. So when 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 the vessel is uh, you know uh, vertical direction, in that case the structural support becomes important. But whenever we are considering a vessel as a horizontal vessel, the balancing space requirement is a important factor. The third point here is to ensure the safety. Uh, the vessel pressure in gauge is set 50 percent higher than the actual process pressure determined from the mass and energy balance. So, this is a safety factor we have to utilize. So, so uh, the pressure, the maximum pressure which the pressure vessel should withstand should be 50 percent higher than the actual pressure which we are calculating from the mass and energy balance. So, this choice also enables the integration of appropriate pressure factors as per the Guthrie's uh, method in vessel cost estimation. So, uh, there is a book by Guthri which is capital cost estimation. So, there how we can calculate the cost of different equipment is given or different uh, process uh, vessels is given. So, we can find out the cost calculation from this particular book. So, for vessel sizing again for the desired temperature range uh, consider the required material of construction as shown in the table. So, the, in this particular table, you can see that uh, if the different temperature ranges are there, which particular material is the most suitable that is, is given. This particular table is taken from the source, uh, a systematic method of chemical process design by Bigler, Grossman and Westerberg. So, you can see that when the temperature is around 950 Fahrenheit, uh, the, uh, the best material to work with is a carbon steel. So, if the temperature is around 1150 Fahrenheit, then it is 502 stainless steel. So, based on what temperature we are looking at, uh, which uh, material is the best, that is what is given in this particular table. So, the type of steel recommended for material of construction at different temperatures compatible with Guthrie's factors is given in this table. These apply to both pressure vessels and remaining equipment items. So, whenever we are doing the vessel sizing, the fundamental configuration for pressure vessels typically comprises a carbon steel vessel designed for a pressure of 15 psig. So, you, in, in a normal case, we uh, use the specification as a pressure specification as 15 psig, again featuring the standard nozzles and manuals. This configuration serves as an initial reference point. So, whenever we have additional information only in that case we are going to change this specification. Otherwise, we will start with a base design of uh, pressure requirement of 50 psig. So, uh, this reference point for both sizing and cost estimation and can be adjusted as per specific process requirements. So, whenever some additional requirements are there then we are going to modify this base design. So, vertical construction entails a cylindrical shell with dished head positions at both the top and the bottom. Whereas, whenever we are looking at the horizontal construction of the cylinder, this involves the cylindrical shell and two dished heads and two saddles for support. So, you can see that whenever we are having the horizontal design, this additional saddle supports are required. In the context of again in a horizontal construction, uh, the assembly includes the shell, two heads and two saddles. The material and pressure factors for various types of vessels is also given in the literature. Uh, in addition to that, the important point to note down here is a material and pressure factor. So, this material and pressure factor, it is nothing but an empirical coefficient established by uh, Guthrie within the costing framework. So, we calculate this material and uh, pressure factor based on what pressure we are looking at and this particular factor is used in calculation of the equipment cost. So, this factor which is determined based on the material of construction, design pressure and vessel diameter multiplies the base cost during the cost evaluation. Again, the table presents the uh, Material and pressure factor values for various vessel types encompassing cylindrical vessels, 
spherical vessels and vessels with disc head this uh, material and pressure factor uh, value span from 1 for carbon steel vessel to 7.89 for titanium vessel designed for pressures of 1000 psig or higher so you can see that if we go from uh, low pressure to high pressure uh, we are going to move from carbon steel to titanium and in that case you can see that uh, the material and pressure factor is increasing from 1 to uh, 7 so you can see that if i am using carbon steel only as a cladding material in that case uh, the increase is uh, uh, lower compared to when i am using the entire solid material so for instance if i am using the carbon steel then then uh, <coughs> the material and pressure factor is 1 uh, and you can see that as we uh, uh, you know go from carbon steel to titanium and if it is used for a cladding material then it is increasing from 1 to 4 whereas if it is used as a solid material then it is increasing from 1 to 7. Also uh, the pressure factor increases as the value of the pressure increases from 50 psig to uh, uh, 1000 psig you can see that the pressure factor is increasing from 1 to 2.5 and all these are having impact on the cost calculations. Now coming back to the next type of you know uh, equipment sizing. Uh, so if you are looking at the heat transfer equipments, uh, so heat exchangers are used to transfer heat between two fluids in a chemical process and are commonly uh, common in commonly used in uh, process industry. So this is a typical uh, shell and tube heat exchanger schematic is shown here. You can see that. Uh, within this shell there will be a bundle of tubes and both the cold fluid and the hot fluids are uh, moving in a counter current direction in this case. Uh, so typical expression used for calculation here is uh, the, the heat transfer Q is given as U A delta T L M T D where U is nothing but the overall heat transfer coefficient, A is the heat transfer area and delta T L M T D is nothing but the log mean temperature difference. So, in this case, you can see that this uh, overall heat transfer coefficient is an empirical parameter that depends on the type of fluid, uh, the flow rates, the geometry of the exchanger and other factors. So, we can calculate, we can calculate in addition to this, we can calculate this U by using the empirical correlation. So, we can have the inside heat transfer coefficient, outside heat transfer coefficient and based on the geometry then we can calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Uh, uh, by using the correlations and that we can use in this equation. Similarly, the log mean temperature difference is given by this equation. So, you can see that if I look at the same heat exchanger, the temperature difference I have to calculate at both the end. So, the temperature difference here will be delta uh, T1 and here the temperature difference will be delta T2. So, delta T1 in this case will be what T1 minus T2 whereas delta T2 is nothing but what T2 minus T1. So, based on this delta T1 and delta T2 then we can calculate log mean temperature difference as delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by log of delta T1 by delta T2. You can see that the log mean temperature difference is primarily used because this temperature difference is varying as we are moving from one end to the another end of the heat exchanger. So, to accommodate this variation in change in temperature, log mean temperature difference is used. So, another, another complications which come across uh, while designing the, uh, while doing the cost calculations for the heat transfer equipment is whenever there is a phase change is taking place. So, a phase change is commonly seen whenever there is a condensation of one fluid is having or evaporation of one uh, uh, fluid is happening. So, in that case what we do is, uh, we calculate U value slightly in a different way. In this case, the exchanger can be split into serial units and the U values for each unit can be calculated, calculated separately. So, for instance, here you can see that uh, this fluid, uh, you can see that the hot fluid is uh, exchanging the heat and then it is condensing. So, from this point onwards, you can see that the temperature is almost remain the same which is Pc. So, one fluid uh, is uh, uh, exchanging the heat in a sensible uh, sensible heat initially and then, then there is a latent heat. Okay. So, you can see that whereas the other fluid, if you look at the other fluid, the temperature is continuously increasing here as we are moving from uh, 
point one to point two. So you can see that we can have uh, two sequential parts here. So uh, just for the sensible heat transfer, this initial part we can take as a part one. Whereas the second part, where the condensation is taking place primarily, so there we can take as part two, and we can calculate the heat transfer area for both these parts, and that we can sum up. So you can see that when we are taking only uh, the sensible heat into the consideration, we are calculating a vapor, which is given as Q vapor divided by uh, U vapor into delta T L M T D. So this U vapor will be again calculated in a different way. So whenever Uh, there is no condensation the heat transfer coefficients are uh, lower so you can see that this u vapor will be a different value calculated from uh, the different correlations whereas u condensation here this in the second equation this u condensation has to be calculated based on, based on uh, uh, the condensation of one fluid so you can see that we can calculate a vapor and a condensation and both of these we are adding here to obtain the total heat transfer area So in Guthrie's cost estimation, the basic configuration for heat exchanger is given by a carbon steel floating head heat exchanger uh, with 150 psig design pressure, and the uh, and this includes the complete fabrication. So you can see that we can use this information in Guthrie's cost estimation method, and we can calculate uh, the cost associated with the heat exchanger. Now let's extend. Uh, our discussion to a next unit which is a reactor so uh, the sizing of the reactor involves determining the space velocity so space velocity is nothing but what space velocity is nothing but how much uh, uh, volume we are processing in the reactor per unit of time so based on the molar flow rate of the liquid or gas and it is uh, let's say if the molar flow rate of the liquid or gas are denoted by mu then we can calculate the space velocity by using this equation so space velocity is given as 1 by space time so that is given as 1 by tau here tau is the space or a residence time and that is given as mu divided by rho v cat so here mu is nothing but the flow rate of the liquid or gas molar flow rate of liquid or gas and uh, rho is the uh, density molar density at standard temperature and pressure whereas the v cat is nothing but uh, the volume of the catalyst so based on this equation we can calculate what is the space velocity s so the, the total volume of the reactor v is calculated considering the wide fraction so whenever we are having the packed reactor in a, in a packed reactor we calculate the volume v by considering the wide fraction let's say the wide fraction uh, of the particles which are there in the reactor catalyst particles those are there in the reactor is let's say epsilon and the value of epsilon is typically taken as 50% so we can calculate v as v catalyst divided by 1 minus epsilon where epsilon if i put 0.5 here i get v equals to 2 into v catalyst okay so depending on operating conditions of the reactor it can be costed as a pressure vessel heat exchanger or furnace so this is a very important so uh, uh, depending on the operating conditions what is important are we looking at pressurizing the reactor and the cost is dominated by the pressure in that case we can we can consider it as a pressure vessel if if the uh, heat transfer is more important in the reactor and that is what is causing the cost in that case we can consider it as a heat exchanger or furnace okay the appropriate material and the pressure factors from the guthrie's method uh, should be considered when estimating the cost of the reactor now now let's extend our discussion to the next type of you know equipments like distillation columns and the absorption columns so you can see that when we are looking at the distillation column the sizing process for distillation columns entails the determination of height so what should be uh, the height of the distillation column what should be the diameter of the distillation column and how many number of trays are there uh, within the stack so this these are the important decisions we have to make when we are doing the sizing of the distillation column so uh, if you are taking a tray stacks uh, you can see that uh, in a guthrie's methodology uh, this feature is standard configuration 
comprising 24 inch trays constructed from carbon steel. So, if I if you look at the Guthrie's methodology for uh, distillation column, it involves this 24 inch tray constructed from the carbon steel. So, these trays can be of plate, sieve, or grid type and include necessary fittings and supports. So, to facilitate costing of the vessel, tray uh, stack and associated heat exchangers, it is imperative to first compute the number of theoretical trays and establish the reflux ratio. So, when we are doing the sizing of the distillation column, the most important point to look at is how many uh, number of theoretical trays are required and what is the reflux ratio that we have to calculate. And for that, we can use different equations. So, you can see that we can calculate the minimum number of theoretical trays by using this Fensky equation, which we have seen in the last session. Again, <coughs> we can calculate the minimum value of the reflux ratio by using this Underwood equation. But you can see that this Underwood equation is typically uh, uh, is iterative, isn't it? So, several uh, iterations are there. So, in order to avoid such uh, simplified direct correlations are usually used by assuming the ideal system and that can give you uh, the calculation of the reflux ratio rapidly for the preliminary design purpose. The third important equation is once we calculate the minimum reflux ratio and minimum number of theoretical trays required, uh, we can again use the Gilliland correlation and we can calculate what will be the actual reflux ratio and tray numbers. Okay. So, uh, the, the correlations are given here. You can see that determining the tray number and reflux ratio for that uh, from the mass and energy balance. Remember, in the last session, we have performed the mass and energy balance uh, around the distillation column. And there we have, uh, you know, by doing the mass and energy balance, we usually fix uh, the relative volatilities. We fix the, uh, the split fraction at the top and the bottom recoveries. So, you can see that we usually know these values. We know uh, alpha LK by HK. So, this is nothing but the uh, relative volatility of the uh, low key component with respect to high key component, heavy key component, light key component and heavy key component. And uh, BLK is nothing but uh, zeta LK which is nothing but the split fraction of the uh, light key component. Similarly, beta HK is nothing but the uh, split fraction of the heavy key component. So, these, these values are already known from the material and energy balance. We can use these split fractions and relative volatility in the correlation. So, this correlation we can use here. The first correlation is with respect to Ni. So, we are calculating the number of trays here. And here I we can put as low key component or high key component. And based on that, we can calculate the uh, maximum and minimum values of the uh, trays required. And similarly, we can calculate the maximum and minimum value of the reflux ratio by replacing this I by LK or HK. And you can we can use this minimum and maximum value of N and R again in the correlation which is given here. So, you can see that the actual number of theoretical trays uh, which is required, we can calculate as gamma N into max I N I plus 1 minus gamma N min Ni. So, minimum and maximum values which we have calculated for the number of trays from this equation, we can put in this equation and we can use this gamma n as uh, value equals to 0 0.8 and we can calculate the theoretical values of number of trays or plates required. Similarly, we can also calculate the, the actual value of the reflux ratio using the similar equation here. So, with this, then we can, we can calculate the cost of the distillation columns. So, typically you can see that these are the two uh, schematics are shown here. You can see that when we are having a feed which is at the bubble point uh, condition. So, you can see that the entire feed will have mostly the liquid and therefore the liquid will be coming down. So, it will be uh, trickling down from the uh, uh, the feed tray to the bottom. Whereas, when we are having uh, the feed at the dew point, it essentially involves the vapor. So, it is going up. So, based on this, uh, we need to have a different calculation. So, you can see that uh, the important calculation in the distillation column is a, to calculate the diameter. So, calculation of the height of the distillation column involves the comprehensive consideration of various components including trays, reflux ratio and operational parameters. So, as we calculate the number of trays, reflux ratio, 
uh, and operational parameters we can calculate what will be the height of the distillation column. Once the reflux ratio and feed compositions are determined, the flow rates within the distillation column can be computed and then by using these flow rates and established relationship for flooding velocity, the column diameter can be calculated. So, uh, remember in this case, we usually want to operate our distillation column with 80 percent of the flooding velocity. So, in order to maintain this 80 percent flooding velocity, what should be the diameter? That diameter should be the appropriate diameter for the distillation column. This is how we calculate the diameter of the distillation column. So, the first step is to calculate number of trays reflux ratio, is not it? Then we calculate the uh, uh, feed compositions and flow rates and based on that, then we wanted to maintain around 80 percent of the flooding velocity and based on that, we calculate the diameter of the distillation column. So, these are the correlations which are used so calculate to calculate the column diameter here we define uh, UNF as a linear flooding velocity. So, this UNF we can calculate as uh, remember for the calculation of the uh, diameter we require the uh, flooding velocity. So, this can be given as uh, CSBF uh, in the bracket rho L minus rho G divided by rho G raised to the power 0.5 into 20 by sigma uh, raised to the power 0.2. So, here you can see that rho G and rho L are the gas and liquid mass densities uh, and uh, sigma is the liquid surface tension in dynes per cm. So, uh, if we are using the hydrocarbons, if you are trying to separate the hydrocarbons, typically the surface tension taken for the hydrocarbons is 20 dynes per cm. If I put that uh, sigma equals to 20 here, this particular equation is eliminated, this particular part of the equation is eliminated uh, and also you can see that rho L minus rho G is typically equals to uh, rho L. So, if we put that this, this original equation can be simplified immensely and we can obtain mu nf is given as CSBF uh, into rho L by rho G raised to the power 0.5 and this particular equation we can use to calculate the linear flooding velocity. So, okay, now let us look at how we can determine the uh, tray stack height. So, so the number of actual trays is given by, uh, okay, so in this case we can, we can use the efficiency into the considerations. So, typically the efficiency of the separation if you take uh, around 80 percent. So, uh, NT that is the number of theoretical trays required divided by efficiency that gives us the, the number of uh, trays required and once we know the number of trays required, uh, assuming a uh, two feet tray spacing, we can actually calculate the height of the distillation column. So, uh, we choose the maximum height around 200 feet. So, if we do the calculation and if the height of the distillation column uh, is coming less than uh, 200 feet or 60 meter, then it is okay. If it is going beyond that, then, then in that case, we can split it into uh, uh, different columns. So, a larger calculated height will be required that the column be split into two with liquid and vapor flows running between them. So, the height of the distillation column should be less than 60 meter for all design purposes. That is what we ensure. Now, now let us extend our uh, discussion on another separation unit which is a absorber. So, in a absorber you can see that uh, the similar methodology which we have used for distillation column we are going to use in absorber also, but uh, there is a slight difference. In the absorber you can see that the efficiency of the absorber is uh, uh, much lower compared to the distillation column. So, absorber column sizes are determined using methods similar to distillation columns taking into the accounts factors such as flow rates, compositions and operating conditions. The number of trays in an absorber column is typically uh, derived from the Kremser equation. So, remember in the last session we have looked at the Kremser equation uh, based on that we can calculate uh, the number of trays which considers the factors such as relative volatility and component recoveries. A low efficiency assumption is often used as a, as equilibrium on trays is generally considered to be poor. Okay. So, remember uh, we said that whenever we are uh, you know trying to find out the cost related to absorbers, the efficiency value is important here because typically the efficiency of the absorber columns are uh, much lower compared to the distillation. 
द हाइट एंड डायमीटर ऑफ द एब्जॉर्बर वेसल एंड ट्रे स्टैक आर फास्टेड इन ए मैनर कंपेरेबल टू दैट ऑफ द डिस्लेशन कॉलम्स ensuring that the equipment meet the required specification for efficient operation and specification so a standard assumption of 24 inch tray spacing so this is the same as the distillation column we are using here so 24 inch tray spacing is required so we can calculate the minimum number of trays we can keep uh, this spacing between each tray as 24 inch and uh, based on that we can find out what is the height of the absorber column so uh, again accordingly the costing of the absorber column uh, we can perform so this provides the practical guideline for tray layout and performance optimization so in addition to tray based absorber designs if if let's say the absorber column is a packed bed uh, in that case uh, again we can use the same gutierrez cost methods so in this case uh, You, we can use the valuable data and insights on the costing and selection of the various packings for absorbers and this can aid in our decision making so what are the packings we are using inside the absorber column based on that different cost factors we have to include and based on that we can calculate what will be the cost associated with the absorber columns and this this uh, design values then we can use for uh, optimization now extending uh, the discussion to the other equipments like pumps so when we are having uh, the pumps the theoretical work for pumping liquid is typically calculated as v delta p so how much is the pressure drop causing across the pump into what is the volume uh, uh, we are handling based on that we can calculate we can calculate the theoretical work required by the pump so <clears throat> the brake horse power for the pump can be determined using the formula remember all these pumps are usually specified in terms of horse power if you go to the market and buy a pump it is given in terms of horse power so what is horse power here we can calculate uh, the rating of the pump in terms of the horse power as mu into delta p divided by rho np eta p and eta m so here you can see that mu is nothing but what mu is nothing but the uh, the molar flow rate whereas Uh, p1 and p2 uh, these are the upstream and downstream pressure so p1 minus p2 is nothing but the pressure drop uh, across the pump rho is the density uh, eta p is the efficiency of the uh, pump whereas eta m is nothing but the efficiency of the motor so based on that we can calculate the horse power of the pump so again again uh, for the pumps we can use the gutierrez uh, cost estimation method to calculate the the capital cost so if we are having let's say a centrifugal pump uh, typically in a gutierrez calculation you can see that these are made up of cast um, if you look at the pumps these are made up of cast iron and operate below a 250 fahrenheit with a suction pressure of around 150 psig cost correlations of the reciprocating pumps are also available in gutierrez cost estimation method and uh, these are offering insights into the costing and selection of the pumps based on the specific operating conditions and requirements so you can see that which pump we should be using that depends on what pressure we are looking for so if you are looking at the higher volume then in that case centrifugal pump is used but when we are looking at the uh, the higher value of the pressure change and low volume in that case we are using the we are using the reciprocating pump again the pump efficiency and motor efficiency play crucial roles in determining the overall energy consumption and performance of the pumping system so highlighting the importance of selecting the efficient pump configuration for cost effective operation okay so now let us extend uh, our discussion to some other equipments like compressors and turbine so ideal assumptions are made for gas compression in sizing the compressors and turbines so we assume that the gas is ideal uh, again uh, <coughs> we can divide uh, these equipment into centrifugal compressors or reciprocating uh, compressors so with relatively uh, high capacities and low compression ratios required in that case we use the centrifugal compressors when we are looking at the low capacities and high compression ratios then we are using the reciprocating compressors so again if you if you are looking at the adiabatic compressor the ideal compression work can be calculated from the change in enthalpy so uh, the work can be given as mu into delta h 
here mu is nothing but the molar uh, flow rate whereas hv is nothing but the enthalpy uh, of the vapor um, gas enthalpy and you can see that delta h is the change in the enthalpy so assuming the ideal system uh, equation can be again this this is nothing but delta h so delta h can be given as cp dt so we can write this w as mu cp dt so here you can see that mu cp into delta t we are having then then this cp value for the ideal gas this cp value can be represented in terms of the uh, heat capacity ratio cp by cv so this is given as mu into uh, gamma divided by gamma minus 1 here you can see that this gamma is nothing but what cp divided by cv and it is taken as 1.4 for the ideal system and uh, the r here taken as a uh, universal gas constant so assuming the ideal uh, isentropic adiabatic expansion we can calculate what will be uh, the temperature t2 from the pressure ratio uh, using this particular equation so t2 divided by t1 is given as p1 by p2 raised to the power gamma minus 1 divided by gamma here gamma value is nothing but 1.4 for the uh, remember in the last slide we said that gamma is given as cp by cv which is equals to 1.4 so substituting this particular uh, temperature in a in a uh, earlier equation so we get the expression for the work w is given as mu into gamma divided by gamma minus 1 into rt1 uh, in in the bracket p1 by p2 raised to the power gamma minus 1 divided by gamma minus 1 so this is the equation we have to use when we are looking at uh, the work required uh, theoretical power required for the compressor so when assessing the efficiencies of the compressors or turbine a standard practice is to select the efficiency value eta equals to 0.8 for compression and for expansion work efficiency for a compressor driven by a shaft driven electric motor if you are having a compressor uh, compressor driven by a shaft driven electric motor then the efficiency value is equals to 0.9 but when we are using the standard practice where the eta value is 0.8 again if the turbine is used as a driver in that case the efficiency value is 0.8 consequently the actual uh, horse power for the compressor is calculated by using this equation so we can we can calculate the actual horse power as once we get this uh, the theoretical power required w divided by uh, eta m and eta c where eta m is nothing but the uh, motor efficiency and uh, eta c is nothing but the compressor efficiency if you ta take that into the account we can calculate uh, how much horse power is required so we need to calculate how much horse power is required for particular compressor because then we can buy the compressor with that specification from the market so you can see that if the motor driven uh, compressor is there in that case it is 1.39 into w whereas when it is turbine driven then it is 1.562 into w very often you can see that the compressors are based on the waste heat turbine or something else isn't it so whenever the turbine is used for uh, running the compressor in that case the equation we have to use is 1.562 w whenever the compressor is running based on the electrically driven uh, driven motor in that case it is 1.39 into w so furthermore it is essential to limit compressor sizes to uh, maximum horsepower of 10000 so we don't want it to have the compressors more than 10000 horsepower okay if you look at the guthrie's method which is there in the book guthrie's cost estimation book if you look at the, uh, it includes different configuration for uh, the compressor cost calculations the primary configuration typically involves a centrifugal compressor equipped with carbon steel circuit uh, operating at a maximum pressure of 1000 psig so this configuration encompasses the motor driver coupling base plate and associated components so this particular calculation is already there in the book you can find out so now remember that when we are using the compressors we assume that it is adiabatic compressor so typically because of the compression uh, you know the temperature increases and uh, you know we don't want to have the uh, temperature of the uh, the the 
uh, equipment going beyond a particular limit. So, in such cases, in order to uh, eliminate this particular problem, typically the compressors are used in a staged manner. We do not use a one big compressor, instead of that we use several uh, compressors, smaller compressors uh, in a staged manner. Okay. So, stage compressors are utilized to achieve a desired increase in gas pressure with reduced work requirement by incorporating the intercooling between the compression stages. So, we can intercool the units. Again, isothermal compression while physically, if we are looking at the isothermal compression, it is physically unrealistic because whenever you are compressing a particular gas, it is going to increase the temperature, isn't it? So, you can see that that is also one reason why a staged compressions are required. So, you can see that the staged compressions showcase the uh, efficiency improvement achieved through the intercooling. So, if you are having the intercooling, then we can have a higher efficiency. For a fixed number of compressors, Maximizing work requirement in staged compression occurs when compression ratio are equalized across the stages. So, what it means is the efficiency increases if you are using all these compressors with same compression ratio. Okay. So, you can see that if I am having a first compressor, if it, it will have a compression ratio of P1 by P0 second will have P2 by uh, P1, third will have P3 by P2 and if all these compression ratios are same in a staged wide compression, then my efficiency is maximum. So, work done in such staged wise compressors, uh, staged compressors given as W is given as mu into N, where N here is the total number of compressors used into gamma divided by gamma minus 1 into RT naught uh, and in the bracket it is Pn by P naught raised to the power gamma minus 1. Uh, divided by gamma n minus 1. So, you can see that this particular equation is used when I am having n such compressors uh, in series one after another. A typical schematic is shown here. You can see that there are n compressors one after another and you can see that the output of one is given to the another and in between you can see that we can have interstage cooling we can have. So, based on that we can have a higher uh, you know efficiencies. Okay. So, in the same equation, in this particular equation, if we take n tends to infinity, uh, the isothermal work required is given as W is given as mu R T naught ln P n by P naught. Now, let us look at the reciprocating compressors. Remember, I said that the centrifugal compressors are used when you require the higher uh, volume, is not it? So, uh, but when you are looking at the large change in the pressure values, in that case the best compressors to be used are reciprocating compressors. So, reciprocating compressors operate by uh, effecting a pressure change through a mechanical volume changes using a piston and cylinder setup. So, you can see that in this case, in this case whatever the volume is there that is getting compressed by using a piston here. Okay. These compressors are best suited for applications requiring low capacities and significant pressure changes. The theoretical power for reciprocating compressors can be calculated based on specific equations considering the factors like clearance and compression efficiency and uh, the, the equation which is used for calculating the, uh, the, the work required uh, is given by the same equation as we have seen earlier except that this entire equation is divided by one more factor which is nothing but 1 minus C into P2 by P1 raised to the power 1 by gamma minus 1. So, this is the additional factor is divided with respect to the previous equation. So, remember this is the previous equation. So, this equation is divided by additional factor which is given by this uh, in the uh, reciprocating compressors. <coughs> So, again in this case the selection between the centrifugal and reciprocating compressors depends on factors such as gas flow rate and desired pressure increase with guidelines available in references like Perry's handbook. So, you can see that if you look at the reciprocating compressors there are these four stages are required. So, in the first stage what we are doing is uh, in the, in the uh, compression cycle uh, in the first stage between 1 to 2 we open and take the gas inside from 2 to 3 we compress the gas, then from 3 to 4 we uh, exhaust the gas and again from 4 to 1 there is the expansion taking place. So, all these 4 stages uh, are involved when we are looking at the reciprocating compressors.
now uh, again looking at the another interesting aspects in the cost calculation which is important in the process application so very often we require uh, some of the you know chemicals to be put at a lower temperature so typically if you uh, look at the production of ammonia in production of ammonia the nitrogen gas is usually kept at a uh, lower temperature isn't it so so hydrogen is kept at a, at a lower temperature isn't it so uh, in such cases we require the refrigeration so refrigeration is essential when a process stream needs to operate below approximately uh, 300 kelvin so uh, requires consideration of a refrigeration cycle so refrigeration system may need to be designed to cool a uh, stream with a focus on balancing capital and operating cost by selecting the appropriate number of refrigeration cycle the pressure enthalpy diagram is a valuable tool in understanding the heat absorbed from the process stream and the heat per unit mass of the refrigerant in the refrigeration cycle and q is the heat absorbed from the process stream at a sub ambient temperature q dash is the heat per unit mass of refrigerant here a single cycle requires the maximum work and cooling water qc while a large number of cycles require uh, minimum work and qc so you can see that when we are looking at the uh, the refrigeration cycle it involves these four stages okay so the first stage is we compress we compress the gas isn't it then then from first stage of the compressor then there is a cooling of the gas taking place in the second stage then then uh, the throttling is taking place so valve is there so where the throttling process is happening and in the fourth stage then evaporation is taking place so with these four stages the refrigeration is performed so if you wanted to look at the pressure and enthalpy diagram this is what is happening in the first stage when we are compressing you can see that the pressure is increasing okay so enthalpy as well as pressure both are increasing when we are compressing then in the second stage what we are doing is we are cooling so the temperature is decrease so that is why delta h is decreasing here in the third stage you can see that the the uh, throttling is taking place so in this case you can see that the uh, volume is increasing so pressure is decreasing and volume is increasing so we are moving from 3 to 4 here and in the fourth stage there is a evaporation is happening so uh, you can see that with this cycle uh, with this cycle you can see that we can perform the refrigeration uh, we can we can reduce the temperature of the process stream so a coefficient of performance is the important factor when we look at the cost estimation of the refrigeration so whenever we wanted to uh, you know look at the performance of the refrigeration uh, the the important factor which is uh, uh, one has to look at is the coefficient of the performance so coefficient of performance is defined to relate the work and the heat rejected in the refrigeration system with a typical guideline suggesting a coefficient of performance around 4 for design purpose so cp here is given as q dash by w dash again typical cycle w is given as q by 4 and qc is given as w plus q minus 5 by 4 q uh, and the compressor driven by electric motor uh, we can calculate wb so this is nothing but the work required so which is given as w by uh, eta m so eta m is the uh, the the motor efficiency and eta c is nothing but the uh, the Uh, compressor efficiency okay so we can use these values to calculate wb so another important point to look at is there are several constant which we need to satisfy uh, when we are performing the refrigeration so uh, the refrigerant must remain below the critical point in the condenser so t condenser maximum you can see that should be equals to 0.9 tcr again if cooling water is used then t condenser maximum should be greater than temperature of the cooling water plus delta t minimum so in the in the evaporator refrigerant and the pressure should be chosen so that temperature of the evaporator should be greater than the temperature of the boiling uh, of the refrigerant also the evaporator pressure should be chosen greater than 1 atmosphere so that you know there is a uh, we are avoiding the leak of the leak to the evaporator 
okay finally we choose the temperature drop around 5k so you can see that when we are going for heating the temperature difference usually used in the heat transfer calculation is 10 degrees whereas when we are looking at the refrigeration that the temperature difference minimum temperature difference required is around 5 degree or 5 kelvin okay so for both the evaporator and condenser we require the delta t of 5 kelvin cost estimation if you look at so see we have seen how we can calculate the size of different equipments uh, so far now we will be looking at how we can calculate the cost for different uh, equipments so you can see that equipment cost increases non linearly with equipment size or capacity and can be expressed using power law expression so we can calculate the actual cost c is given as c not into s divided by s not raised to the power alpha here the exponent can be less than 1 so you can see that s not and c not are the base capacities and cost so if we know the base capacities and cost for the new value of uh, capacity we can calculate what will be the cost so for a different equipment this value of alpha is defined and we can find out these exponent values uh, from the literature so this non linearity reflects an economy of the scale where incremental cost increase with larger capacity so if we are increasing if the larger capacities are there in that case in that case the cost increases uh, uh, with a lower rate so so based on that Uh, the non linear equations are used here so again for a pressure vessels service capacity is related to volume while the cost is linked to the weight so uh, weight of the metal required so remember when we are you know making the uh, pressure vessels how much material is required for making the particular vessel is important and that is kind of you know uh, reflected in the cost that so which is proportional to the surface area so okay you can see that for a spherical vessel we can calculate volume as pi by 6 dq and then we can calculate the weight of the spherical vessel so that will be given as density of the material into thickness of the vessel into area so remember area is important so uh, weight is proportional to the area and uh, if you see that whenever you do the calculations uh and you wanted to minimize the amount of material required for manufacturing these vessels you you basically minimize the surface area so in this case again the weight is represented in terms of the uh, the area if i put the diameter in this particular equation you can see that the cost is uh, proportional to the weight and it is proportional to the volume raised to the power 2 by 3 so it is proportional to the area but when we are having volume it is proportional to the volume raised to the power 2 by 3 it is not directly proportional okay so it is non linearly uh, related with the volume but it is directly related with the area if we are having the cylindrical pressure vessels in a cylindrical pressure vessels both length as well as diameter is important and therefore the cost is calculated as c not into l by l not raised to the power alpha into d by d not raised to the power beta here alpha and beta are the exponents which uh, we can find out from the literature so uh, here l not and d not are the uh, the the base size and base length and base size for which the cost are available but for any other length and the uh, diameter we can calculate the cost by using this particular equation so again additionally if you look at the guthrie's uses the log log charge to represent the cost if you look at the guthrie's cost estimation book uh, you can see that there is a log c versus uh, uh, this uh, cost is represented so you can see that the cost we have represented as what cb which is a base cost into s by sb raised to the power n isn't it so here sb is the uh, the base uh, value of the uh, uh, particular uh, variable isn't it so it could be diameter it could be length isn't it so uh, if we take a log of that what we get is log c is given as log uh, uh, cb by sb raised to the power n so this first term is nothing but the intercept whereas uh, n into log s is there so n is the slope of the curve whereas uh, the log s is the uh, nothing but the uh, the variable isn't it 
so you can see that the log log charts which are given in the guthri is cost estimation book actually follows this second equation so log c is plotted with respect to log s okay so the slope of the chart corresponds to the exponent n while the cost deviation in guthri's data can be um, if you look at how much it is deviating with respect to the actual values around 20% is the deviation median data is typically used for preliminary design purposes again to adjust this cost for inflation and updated factor so remember that the inflation is also going to increase the cost and for that updating factor update factor is used and this update factor can be obtained as present cost index divided by base cost index and this update factor is used when we are calculating the actual cost so uh, in guthrie's modular method it provides a structured approach to estimating the equipment cost by considering various factors and cost module the method involves breaking down the total cost of equipment into different components so these are the there are different components are they like base cost is there then the modular factor is there then material and pressure factor is there and installation cost is there so bare module cost is calculated as the product of the base cost and the module factor so uh, it is given as the bare module cost bmc is given as the base cost into module factor again the uninstalled cost is determined by multiplying the base cost with material and pressure factor so uninstalled cost is base cost into material and pressure factor and the installation cost are calculated as a difference between the product of the base cost and the module factor and the base cost so this this installation cost can be represented as base cost into the module factor minus base cost so that is that is given as base cost into module factor minus 1 the total installed cost is the sum of the uninstalled cost and the installed installation cost and it is defined as total uh, total installed cost is nothing but base cost into uh, 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 mfp plus mf minus 1 so you remember in this case mf is what mf is nothing but this mf is a module factor whereas uh, mfp is nothing but the material and the pressure factor so we can use this and we can calculate total installed cost as base cost into mf m m mpf which is nothing but uh, m pressure factor and the mf is the module factor minus 1 so updated bare module cost is calculated using an update factor remember i said that because as in, in because of inflation we have to account the update factor to adjust cost from the base year to the present year so we might be having the base cost with respect to a particular year and we are interested in calculating the cost at the current year so in that case we have to calculate the update factor and that update factor we have to multiply so module factor is influenced by the base cost and specific values are assigned based on the different ranges of the base cost the material and pressure correction factor are used to adjust costs based on the type of material and pressure involved in the equipment design that is what we have seen depending on what material we are using what pressure conditions we are using uh, based on that the cost will increase or decrease okay and the final point here is the guthrie's modular method simplifies the cost estimation by incorporating factors like materials pressures construction types inflation adjustment to provide the comprehensive estimate of the equipment cost for industrial processes so you can see that almost up to uh, you know uh, 20% error margin we can calculate the the cost for different uh, equipment and installations and that we can use for making the decisions so uh, this is all for the equipment sizing and cost estimations uh, and we stop here uh, thank you everyone